Okay, start recording. Okay, so continuing here, um, each of those little uh, words in white on blue is a separate tab. And it's a separate set of instructions. So if you click on one of those, you'll get a different ribbon. I'm not going to bother with them right now because uh, you'll probably very seldom need to go to them. Uh, the only one you'd really need occasionally is the one on the far left that says file. And that, if you click on that, you would get that screen that I just showed you, which had the blue vertical menu, right? And those are all the options for file that you can read a file, you can write a file, you can create a new file, you can print it and so forth. That's under file. Everything else <clears throat> primarily that we need to do is under this, under this ribbon entry or this tab, uh, ribbon tab called home. And so uh, that's the good news. There are many, many more features, but those are the one, this is the one that really uh, accounts for what you need to do. So <clears throat> what, uh, to again, look at the, at how this, this ribbon is structured. Everybody will remember, I mentioned last time and I'm gonna go over it again, that there are these little gray vertical lines. You can see the gray line here and you can see the next one here. And underneath there's the title which says font. And then there's another gray vertical line here. So this little group here is called paragraph and way on the left it says clipboard. And then over here is one that says style. So between these verti soft vertical uh, gray bars are the various groups of functions. Uh, I don't know why they made them that soft gray. They should have made them a bright red or something so they're easier to see. But once you've used it a couple of times, it's really pretty straightforward. So <clears throat> in this section over here, where it says font, that is all the instructions, all the, the buttons that relate to the font that you are printing in. The font is the, the typeface, the kind of typeface. And most of us never even notice it, but there are different typefaces. And if you go look at a newspaper and look at some of the words in a newspaper, and then you look at say People magazine or some magazine, you'll usually see they different, they use different fonts. And in some publications, newspapers or magazines or whatever, you may see different fonts uh, in the same document. So for example, if there's a picture, very often the whatever's under the picture telling you about the picture will be a little smaller, right? It'll be, it'll be in a in a smaller size font or a different font entirely. But Basically, they all really do the same thing. A font is just a, a set of letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and one, two, three, four, five, and commas and periods and exclamation points and pound signs and so on, exactly what's on your keyboard. And the font is just the way that it's gonna appear on the print on, 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 on the paper. <clears throat> so uh, if we now go back to font, you'll see that it says, you'll see that there's a little box at the top just under the word home and it's got a box in and it says Calibri body. And all that means is Calibri is the name of a font. That's all it is. This happens to be the default, but your default can also, the, mo the most common, two of the most common faults are fonts are Calibri and Times Roman. Strange names, doesn't matter. The name doesn't mean anything. It could just as well call it John or Mary. It's just the name. Times, Times Roman is the font you'll normally see in a newspaper. Calibri is the font that you'll often see in magazines, but that's not an absolute rule because whoever produces the newspaper or the magazine or the book can use whatever font they like. And if you look in, if you've got two or three books or magazines and you look at them and you look carefully, you'll see the font is different. Not greatly different. An E is still an E and a P is still a P and an X is still an X and a five is still a five. It's just that the details of the font are slightly different. So for most purposes, I just leave the, the default at Calibri. But if you, if you prefer, let's say Times Roman, which is the font that's used in newspapers, all you have to do is change that. So the question then is, how do I change it? And again, I throw that to the class. See who was listening last time. How would I change that font? If I don't like Calibri, I want, there, there are at least 60 fonts built into Word, right? Um, you can have, you can use anyone you like. Some of them are really weird. Uh, some of them are, you know, simple, elegant, but they're things from the various type fonts I've already spoken about, but you can even have mathematical fonts, which have got all the mathematical symbols in, or you can even have script fonts. Script is where it actually makes it look like joined handwriting, right? And it actually joins the letters up. So it kind of looks like you wrote it by hand, you know, the the, the skill if you click there. on the little side button. Right. So yeah, it, it, every, like everything here 
the the uh, the options are given instead of having a list of options or go to find out how to do it, you'll see a little arrow. And next, just to the right of Calibri body, there's a little down pointing arrow. And if you just click on that arrow, click on that arrow, what will happen is a, a whole list of fonts will open up and you can scroll up and down those fonts. There are probably at least 60 of them, maybe even 100, um, most of which you know we'll never use. But some of the fonts are kind of cool ones and you might use it Let's say you were typing, I've used some of the fancier fonts when I was typing out name lists, say for a, for a dinner, right? So, um, you know, people coming for dinner or you're having a party, you might want to have a name list, you know, name for each person in front of them. You can use some of the cool fonts that have got colors in and, you know, they're slightly fancier than just the ordinary type font. So if, you, if, you, if you're happy with Calibri and you'll see it as soon as you type, you start typing, and we'll see in a moment some examples of Calibri. If you press on that little arrow, that little down arrow right over there, you can see where my cursor is. Um, <clears throat> it will automatically um, open up a little menu, and you can make your choice. Question, how do we make the menu go away? When we, when we finished our menu, or let's say we choose not to choose anything on the menu, I just looked up, I saw the menu, and I thought, no, I don't want any of those. I'm just going to stay with Calibri. I don't make the menu go away. Just click it again. You can either click the, the arrow again or press the escape key. So as in many things in Windows and Microsoft Windows, the escape key, once you have a little menu up, the escape key is a quick way to get rid of a menu that has popped up. So it pops up. It's using some of the real estate on the screen. If you hit the escape key or you press the little down arrow again, that little menu will go away. Now, next to uh, Calibri, there's a number there. On the screen, it's the number 11. What does that mean? It's the size, that, of, the font. That, it's the size of the font, exactly. And for some reason, Microsoft use these numbers are actually related to printing, to professional printing. And uh, it doesn't actually mean much to us. It's not inches or centimeters or anything. It's just some printing number. And mm -hmm. all we need to know is that 11 is smaller than 12 and 12 is smaller than 16 and so on. The smaller the number is, uh, the smaller the font is, the bigger the number, the bigger the font. And the numbers range from, I think, eight. Eight is a very teeny font all the way up to, I don't know, 72, where 72 is big enough to make a, a big poster. You know, if, you, if you're selling your car and you want to make a for sale sign and put it up outside your house or something, you could do it in 72 font, which would be, you know, the letters would be, you know, you'd only get about five letters on the page, but they'd be really, really big and black. And you can choose, uh, you know, any size that you like. So I normally, again, I stay with the, with the default. Uh, you may find that you prefer 12, which is a little bigger than 11, or you prefer 10, which is a little smaller. You can choose that. And I'll, again, in, in, probably in the next session, I'll show you how you can set those as default. So that once you've, the beauty, Microsoft Word is really a very clever piece of software. So once you've chosen the way you want things to be, you can set that as a default. So it always stays the same. Um, <clears throat> let's move on. So, uh, you know, we've already spoken about the ribbon. So here's the ribbon and you can see the home tab more clearly now and then insert design layout references and so on, you will almost never go to any of those. I will occasionally go to layout uh, and occasionally I'll go to review. Review you'll need when you review somebody else's work and that allows you to put changes, edits in so they, but the, the old versions stay there, just they're X'd out, they crossed out. So the person can see what changes you made. If you don't edit other people's work, you don't need it. Uh, and the rest of them, again, are relatively specialized. So mostly you're going to spend your time in home and file. <clears throat> okay, so excuse me, let's go back there. So there, more clearly, you can easily, when anybody's not, not sure what we were saying, there in green now is that whole little section between the gray lines, I put it in green, so it's, it stands out more easily, called font, and so on, right. Now, in every case, as I said to you, the little arrow will tell you, let, let's, let's go back to here. The little arrow will give you more options in every single case. So, uh, for example, um, 
there's a little arrow in the like in a little almost like in a little square in the bottom right hand corner of each of these each of these sections so you can see it here next to paragraph you can see it next to clipboard you can see it next to font you can see it next to styles because it's off the edge of the page and we don't really need it but if all, all this means is that if there are not enough options already for you in those buttons they put in the major buttons you would like to use if you click on that little arrow there will be more options very seldom does one need to do it to, to click on, on these little arrows in the, in the bottom right hand corner of each of the section because they've pretty much given you everything that you need. Okay, so <clears throat> keep going on where we were last time. The two options that I use all the time are font and paragraph. So font is the one in green, paragraph is the one just to the right of it. And then occasionally, the one to the far left, which is clipboard, and I'm going to talk about each of those. <clears throat> so let's look at let's look at uh, let's go back to um, to, uh, to to font. So we've we've got the two options. First, the the actual name of the font. We've spoken about that. There it is, and the size of the font. And then you can choose, you can change those to your heart's content. Then we start having these funny little letters and numbers and pictures and so on down below. And uh, we went through that and I think everybody will understand it's pretty straightforward. I'm gonna go over it again and then I'm gonna do a few of those that we didn't do last time. So the first three are the ones right under Calibri here. There's a B, an I and a U. Who remembers what those are? Bold. Bold, B is bold, right? I, I insert, I mean, italics. Italic, right? And, and you, underline. B, underline. For you. Right, so, so you can actually see the letter B is bold, it's, it's, it's darker. The letter I is sort of leaning over a bit yeah. to the right, and that's italic. And then the U has got an underline, and that's when you underline text. So if you're about to start typing, and you hit the, the B bar, you click on that little B, the B will light up. You'll actually see that it's lit up, right? That means that it's now active. And then whatever you type will be in a bold form. It'll be slightly darker you would you, you might use bold for headings or you might use it to emphasize a word if you wanted to emphasize it you could put it in bold similarly if you want to italicize words so sometimes if you might say uh you quoting from uh, from a book you might say uh, um, uh shakespeare's macbeth macbeth sometimes the, when we're quoting a book we put it in italics to show it's it's a, it's, a, it's a name, you might press the I, and of course, underline is a different way of emphasizing. So if you want to underline something to show that, you know, I'm, I'm emphasizing it, you would press the I. How would we stop bolding? So let's say I want to bold one word, I click on the B, I type the word, how do I now go back to normal? I'm click it. Click it again, right? So the, these little, so each of those little letters, B, I, U, is kind of like an on off switch. If it's off and you click it, it goes on. And if it's on already and you click it, then it goes off. It's exactly like the light switch, you know, in, 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 in your house. When you, if it's on and you, you press the switch the other way, it goes off and vice versa, right? So those are the first three things that we need. And those are very, very useful. Now, there are two ways we can use those. One, as I said a moment ago, is before you start typing, uh, you, you know, you say to yourself, I'd like to emphasize the next three words. So before you start typing the next three words, you hit the B and then all three of, and you keep on typing, those words will now be bold. And when you finish those three words and you don't want to, you don't want to emphasize anymore, then you press the B again and they go off. If you have already typed stuff, let's say you have a paragraph and you've typed it. Uh, for example, look at down below in, in red. Uh, let's say I'd already typed that and I didn't highlight groups of re related commands uh, that was not bolded. Now, I can now, after the fact, bold it in a very simple way. So let's say I wanted to now highlight those words, groups of related commands, exactly as it is on the screen. All I need to do is put my cursor to the left of the G, hold down the left mouse button. So the one that you press with your forefinger the left mouse button is this one here. Hold it down and then you find, and then drag it to the right. Just hold it down and drag it across to the end of the S. And the, the, those letters will 
they'll change color, right? It depends on, on a version of word you've got. Some of them, the background becomes gray, some it changes to blue, but you'll know that you have selected those particular words. You can select one letter, one word, two words, five words, or a whole paragraph. You can select, it just depends how far you drag it. So if I wanted to select this entire paragraph, I would put my cursor to the left of the first E and drag it all the way down to the, to the period after on the second line. <clears throat> Once it's highlighted, if you now press the B or the I or the U, it will automatically apply the B or the I or the U to that, to all those words. So in my case here, I've now put my cursor next to the G, held down the left mouse button, dragged it across to the end of the word, to the S of commands, and then hit the bold, and it would look exactly like what I'm seeing now. If I then wanted to highlight this word font at the end of the first line, put my cursor to the left of the F, hold down the left mouse button, drag it to the T, so that you'll see the, the word F-O-N-T will light up, hit the bold or the italic or the underline, and it will be applied. You can do it to one word, two words, 10 words, an entire paragraph, a whole page, whatever. It's quite simple to do. You just, again, remember, <coughs> highlight. Uh, it's a pity that Microsoft used the word highlight because that's got nothing to do with, you know, highlighting with a yellow pen as we used to do when we were college, for which there is a button I'm going to talk about in a moment as well. But highlight in this context just means tell word which words you wanted to to look at. So I wanted to look at the words groups of related commands. And once I've highlighted in that sense, those words, I can then press the B button or the I button or the, or the U button. <clears throat> you can also change anything else. So for example, if I wanted to change font on the second line, I could do that too. All I have to do is highlight the words on the second line, go to that font button up top, press the down arrow, and choose a different font. So you can actually mix and match fonts or size. If I wanted the words on the second line to be bigger or smaller than all the others, for some reason, best known to me, highlight the words, go to the, the where it says 11, click on the little button, and a whole series of numbers will pop up, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 20, 21, 26, 30, and so on. And I could choose 20. And those particular words that I had highlighted would now be in font size 20 or whatever, okay? Everybody got that? All of these yes. can mixed and matched. You can, I mean, you know, you can do crazy thing. Uh, you can bold and italic. If you click both buttons, it will bold it and italicize it. You can click bold and underline or italic and underline or bold italic underline. I don't know why you'd ever want to do that, but all of these buttons are independent. You can turn them on and you can turn it off just as you can turn off the font and the font size, okay? Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna keep going a little more detail on what I did last time here. So let's keep looking at some of the numbers. So uh, below the bold italic BIU, but right below you'll see an A, sort of like a, a fancy A. If you click on that, that, that allows you to do, um, you know, sort of- Shadowing. That, that kind of double font. Can you see that, you know, which you might use for the, you know, I don't know, something, you want something to look really fancy. It would look like that double A. And in fact, if you click the little arrow next to the A, you'll get some different options of what kinds of, these are special effects. So you might want to, you know, you'll sometimes see in a magazine, the first word of the first paragraph is often big. They do that in printing. So you may see that in a newspaper, but very often in a magazine, uh, let's say the first, the first word of the, par of, of the article is the, right? Then you, they often will make the T a big word and fancy like that. And so again, you click there from that moment on, all of the word, all of the, whatever you type will, will look like that. Like those, you know, that, that fancy double A that you can see there. Again, very seldom would we use this, but you might use it if you were doing a brochure or, a, or, or you were doing a newsletter, you know, to make it look nice, you can, you, you can, change, you can change to that <clears throat> fancy font, but you usually only do it temporarily, maybe for a heading or something like that. You might want to make the heading look really, really, you know, cute. So you could use this kind of 
special double form. Right next to it, <clears throat> and now again, you'll start to see how they, how they actually come up with these little icons. You'll see something that looks like a pen, and it's yellow underneath, and above it says AB. And that is what we used to call the old highlight. You know, we use the highlighter pen, right? Now you can do that as well. Uh, if you really wanted to highlight something by, you know, making it the background yellow, not changing the letters or anything, but making the background yellow, then all you'd have to do is, let's say, highlight this paragraph here in the old way, highlight, excuse me, in the Microsoft way or the Word way, put my cursor to the left of the E, drag it all the way to the end of, of the, you know, down and to the right to the end of document. And then if I click that little yellow button, what, what do you think is going to happen? It would be as if I, I used an, a, a yellow marker, right? The, the, the highlighting that we used to do at school and college, and everything will have a yellow background. I could do that on one word or one paragraph or whatever. So, you know, pretty useful. So let's see now. You'll notice that next to that highlight, there's a little arrow. What do you think will happen if I click that arrow? This one here. Different colors. You'll, you'll be able to highlight in a different color, exactly. And they got about 20 colors. You want to highlight it in blue, green, purple, yellow, red, whatever you want. That's it. Again, most times if I've ever used that, which isn't too often, yellow is fine because that highlights it. But if you wanted to highlight it in red or green or blue, you just click on that. You'll see that there'll be a little palette of colors coming up and you would click on the red one and you can now highlight it in red. <clears throat> um, uh, now, to the right of that, you'll see the letter A, and it's standing on, on like standing on a red color, right? That is actually the color of the font. So the one that we've just done leaves the font in black as it is now, but it highlights it as if you'd drawn a uh, with a highlighter pen. <clears throat> a marker pen across it and highlights it in that color. This one is the actual color of the font. So if you wanted to do a word in a different color, in red, for example, so if I now highlighted the words groups of related commands and I press that, that button with the red underline, they all the letters would change to red, right? And of course, you can see the little arrow next to it. And it's obvious what that arrow is for again. It's a palette of colors. You can change the colors to green, blue, purple, yellow. I don't know, they got about 20 colors and you can, you can have hundreds more, but I'm not gonna bother with that at the moment. Right? Most, most, <clears throat> most of the standard colors are there and that's all you'd really need. So uh, you can see now we've had three options. The big A, which is you know, those fancy kind of double, -like, double letters. Uh, the highlighting in the sense of yellowing the, the text, uh, the red, which is changing the color of the text, right? So when you print it out, the print, the text will print out in red and you can do the whole thing in red or blue or green or just certain words. Usually one will do just certain words. You might be highlighting it or there might be some other reason why you want to change the color of the text. Okay, <clears throat> right next to it, you see a capital A and a small a, okay? Who can guess what that might be? See if you can figure it out. They Changing you... the capitals or uppercase. Right, or... exactly, the case, exactly. You see how they show you a capital A and a small a? So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you wanted to type something in all caps, let's say a heading, you wanted, and we'll see some examples. Uh, in a moment when we look at some of our documents that I've got in here. Uh, if you want to do the heading in all caps, you can either, before you start typing the heading, you could put your, you could put your, your finger on the shift key, right? And hold it down and type it and everything will be in the uppercase shift. So not, a, not, not lowercase ABC, but uppercase ABC. Or the alternative here is if you've already typed it, um, all you do is highlight, Highlight the words that you want, the whole line, if it's, it's a heading or just certain words. And uh, if you click the little down arrow, you'll get three or four options. The three or four options are, one is all caps, right? So if you just click on then 
all caps, it'll say all caps, whatever you've typed will suddenly all become in capitals now. That's the way I usually use it because that's the lazy man's way of doing it. I don't bother to hold down the shift key and stuff like that. I just type the text I want, then highlight it, hit that little button, bingo, and it's all caps. The other one is all lowercase. Let's say you've accidentally typed something in uppercase. That can easily happen on the stupid keyboard we've got. Um, as I explained in the Word course, uh, excuse me, in the Windows course, one of the dumbest things they've done on the keyboards on, on laptops and computers is that stupid caps lock key, right? Once you press the caps lock key, this was a leftover from typewriters, right? When it was hard to type and hold down the cursor, the, the caps lock at the same time, you could hit the caps lock key, which locked it into caps. But the caps lock key sits right, right next to the letter A and Q, especially the letter A. So it's very easy when you're typing fast to hit the caps lock key, and then suddenly everything you've typed comes out in caps, and you've got to go delete it and type and, 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 and correct it. This is a much easier way to do it. So if you've typed everything in caps, you can highlight it, click on that little arrow there. One of the options is lowercase. So everything will change to lowercase. <laughs> then the next one, the next option, which is a very useful one, is uh, sentence case. And sentence case says the first word in a sentence has a capital letter, right? Like in, in, in the red box down below, the word each, the first word each, the capital E, and then ACH, that's typically how we do a uh, sentence. So if you highlighted a whole sentence and you said change this to sentence case, it would just capitalize the first word. Now, that one you usually type yourself, so it's no big deal. The other one, uh, the, 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 the fourth one that they've got um, is, uh, I think they call it uh, heading case or something like that. And that's where each word is capitalized. So, for example, if you look at the title at the top of the screen of the slide, the ribbon in MS Word, each word, except in in this case, but each word is capitalized. The ribbon MS Word. The, 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 that, 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 that's the kind of capitalization we typically use in a heading. So you might type exactly like in this case, yeah, the heading on, this, on the screen. Uh, that's exactly how I did it. I just typed it all in lowercase. I then highlighted it hit the little arrow there and said, please make this um, uh, heading case where each, and it'll actually say to you, each word is capitalized. And it'll capitalize each word for you automatically. So you can do some really clever stuff just by highlighting the appropriate words and then clicking the appropriate button. Um, <clears throat> okay, to the right of that AA and right under the L, uh, excuse me, under the 11, you'll see two A's again, right? One has, got, one has got the letter A and it's got a little arrow pointing up. One's got a, a little, the letter A and an arrow pointing down. What do you think those two do? That's like a subscript or something? No, no, we're okay. coming to that, we're coming to that. No, the arrow upwards, <clears throat> that, that's a good thought actually, but they, they use a different uh, notation for that. We'll, we'll talk about it in a moment for subscripts oh, okay. and, and, and superscript. Uh, here the A going up is make the make the font bigger, and the A going down. You can see the, the 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 one with the arrow going up is a bigger A, and the other one is a smaller A. Do you see that the relative sign? So you could use that, but you could click on that that the little arrow next to the either the A going up or the A going down. It will give you a list of fonts, and you can choose. You know, if you wanted to make it, you wanted to highlight all a whole lot of text and then change it to a bigger font or a smaller font, right? But of course, uh, that's really, in a sense, a bit of a waste because you can already do that uh, on that first line by just changing the number, right? So if I highlighted, if I highlight the words groups of related commands again, and then I, I click on the arrow next to the 11 and change it to 14, those, just those words will now be in the bigger font or the smaller font, right? So this is not really necessary. But to answer your very perceptive point about up, uh, superscript and subscript, here on the first line, you'll see uh, X2 and X2. Can you see that? Yes. Everybody see that? So one's got an X with the two down below and right next is an X with the two up above. The one with the two down below is, it'll make the, the letters go downwards a little bit and the other one will make them go up. So when would you use down? If you're using like, 
scientific formulas, H2O, you know, for water. If you remember that from school, H and then a little two down below and then O, H2O, that's a subscript, we call it, goes down. And the, the one that goes up, uh, the two, you might use that if you were putting a, a reference to a note. So if you look in books very often, you'll see a little number above, like the, above the word, but smaller, it would say a two or a one or a three or something like that. That's referring to note one or note two or note three. There could be a note at the beginning, at the bottom of the page or at the end of the chapter. And that's, that, that, uh, that would be the superscript. Again, very seldom that we're going to use that. So I just mention it for what it's worth and we can move on. Everybody got that? Very useful stuff in there, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about paragraph, the one to the right. <clears throat> I'm gonna start in the middle again and you'll see in the middle of paragraph, there are these three, excuse me, four kind of slight similar icons. They've just got lines on them. Can you see these four here? And these four are how you justify the paragraph. And justify means how the text is lined up. So I'll, I'll explain it right away and then you'll immediately see what each of them is. So the first one you can see, the lines are justified to the left, but slightly ragged on the right. That's how often, you know, it might be in a newspaper. The newspapers like to do that. So the, the left side, everything's lined up, but the right side, you know, when you run out of space on the right, it goes on to the next line. By the way, Word does that for you. You don't have to watch for the end of the line. You just type, and when Word determines that the word that you're typing isn't going to fit on the line, it'll automatically move you to the next line. It'll take, it'll take the word off the first line and put it at the beginning of the second line. That happens automatically. So you don't have to bother about, you know, will this fit or not like you had to do with, with an old typewriter. It'll automatically move it to the next line. Then you'll see the one just to the right of that has got the lines centered. And again, if I've typed, you know, if I've typed, let's say the ribbon in MS Word here at the top, if I highlighted it again in the usual way, put my cursor to the left of the T, drag it across to the right to the end of the D, and then hit that second button, it'll automatically center the text. It's actually amazing to watch. It, it's, it's so clever. It will just center the text. But now that text will always remain centered. So if you remove one word, it will shorten the, the, the whatever you've typed, let's say you've taken out a word, but it will still keep it exactly centered, even though you've taken out a word. If you put in two words into a heading, it will still adjust it so it's always exactly the same distance from the left as it is from the right. Very, very clever. Uh, what do you think the next one does? This one over here. The third one from the left. It, it would align it to the left or right. To the right. To the right. It'll align it to the right. Now, the only time we ever align things to the right is when? Columns of figures, numbers, right? So if, you, oh, if, yeah. if you're typing, let's say, uh, you, you know, you, you, you're balancing your checkbook and you're typing out 47.35, 123.21, and so on, you want them lined up to the right. So the decimal points are all under each other, right? You, don't, you wouldn't type it to the left where it would come out all zigzaggy. So uh, accountants or anybody doing work with numbers would use the, the, third, the third one, which is alignment to the right. Seldom used, not, not very often. The one that I like most is the fourth one, and who knows what this might mean, this one here. <clears throat> It's like justified, I think they call that. It's justified on both sides, exactly. They call it text justification. So now it lines it up on the left and it lines it up on the right. How does it line it up on the right? Very, very clever. When you type a, a, a line, when you get to the end, it says, right, this, this, this last word won't fit on that line. So it automatically moves it to the next line. But it instantaneously also adds tiny spaces into the words you've already typed so that the last word exactly lines up on the right. And if you add in words, it will do it again. And if you take out words, it will do it again. It'll always be lined up exactly on both sides, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. In fact, if you look at this text down here in the red box, that's lined up exactly left and right 
and 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 I used exact simply press that button to get it lined up exactly like that. Obviously, if you've done a paragraph, the only line that isn't lined up to the right would be the last line in the paragraph that might have fewer words, right? So when you hit the when you press the period and press enter, which is the end of the paragraph, obviously it can't adjust that because maybe you've only had one or two words on that line. So all the all the, the entire paragraph will be lined up both sides, except possibly for the last line. And again, if you look in books, mostly that's how it's done. You'll see if you look at books or usually magazines as well, uh, that's how it's done. Newspapers seem to mix it up. You'll probably find that some pages in the newspaper are left aligned. In other words, it's ragged on the right. In other words, it, it doesn't try and adjust it on the right. Or it's completely text justified like this one, and it's aligned both ways, right? Both sides are remain. I like the align both sides because it looks it looks pretty cool. It doesn't really make a lot of difference, especially if you're you know, just typing a letter or something like that. But it shows how just by pressing a little button, you can make stuff really, really cool. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, above those justifications in the paragraph, you'll see this one over here, which has got sort of three lines on it with dots next to it. What do you think that button does? Do you see this one here? Everybody see it? Your, your arrow isn't pointing. Oh, you can't see my cursor? No. Weird? Yeah, you can see it now. Oh, that's strange. It's on my other screen. Okay, well, that's even easier for me because the other screen's bigger. Um, Makes bullets. <laughs> bullets. If you see here, these ones here, that's the bullets, exactly. Yeah. So if you type, you type some text, let's say we're typing, a, um, I don't know, grocery list. I'm going to Kroger's, I'm going to buy groceries. You type one line, you type eggs, the next line you type milk, the next line you type you know, fruit, whatever. If you now highlight all of them and press this button, it'll put a, it'll shift them all in a little bit and it'll put a, a round bullet next to each one of them, right? So now it, you, you get what is called bullets of tech. What do you think the little down arrow does? This down arrow next to the bulletin. Well, like everything else, you've got plenty of plenty choices in Word. It will uh, it'll allow you to change the bullet. So if you don't like the round bullet, you could have a square bullet or a triangular bullet. Or you don't like the bullet filled in, you just like it like a little circle, like the letter O. Uh, you, they're all dozens of possibilities. Again, I very seldom use that. A nice little solid filled black bullet is perfectly okay. But you can change them. In fact, you could change the color of the bullets. One, one of the options would be, I'd like all my bullets to be in red. If that's what you want, Microsoft Word is only too happy to give it to you, right? So that's for bulleting. The one next to it is kind of interesting as well. It shows, shows you lines of text with numbers next to them. What do you think that does? Numbers. numbers. It numbers the text, exactly. It numbers the paragraphs. So if you type a whole paragraph, like let's look what's here on the screen, each tab contains blah, blah, blah. Uh, if I press the, the, the number, then the, the whole paragraph would have been indented slightly. And then to the left of the paragraph would be the number one. As soon as I get to the end of the paragraph, let's say you have the word document and I hit the enter key. Normally you don't have to enter the, hit the enter key. So at the end of the line, when you're typing, you don't, don't hit the enter key. It'll, Word will handle it for you. The only time you hit the enter key is when you want to tell Word, that paragraph's done, I'm finished. I want to start a new paragraph. And then what it will do is it'll, indent the next paragraph in the same way, and it'll put in the new number. So if the first one was one, the new paragraph will be two and three and four and so on. The, the power of this, the beauty of this is if you delete a paragraph, let's say, you type four paragraphs and you decide to delete the third one. No problem. You, you, well, again, let, let, let me ask you the question. Oh, let, 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 uh, let's hold that thought. I'm going to ask you the question how you delete a paragraph. But let's say we delete the paragraph. Then the fourth, par let's say we delete the third paragraph. The fourth paragraph will move up to where the third one was. The third one will disappear. And the fourth paragraph will now be number three. So it always keeps the numbers in play. If you add in a paragraph between paragraphs four and five, the new paragraph will become four and the old four will become five. It, it will continuously update them. It's, 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 it's really, really clever. So if you were doing a shopping list and you didn't bullet them, you numbered them, 
they would go one eggs, two milk, three fruit, four, you know, and so on, right? And if you added one in, it will automatically uh, adjust it suitably up or down. So back to my question, let's say I have a whole paragraph and I want to delete it. Well, let, let's go back a step. If I want to delete a word, how would I do that? So let's say I've got this paragraph here, which says each tab contains blah, blah, blah. And I choose to delete the word, um, the words groups of. And now I wanted to read each tab contains several related commands. I want to delete those two words. I've, I've Highlight groups of and hit right. the delete button. Hit, highlight groups of and hit the, hit the delete key. The delete key you'll see is in usually in the uh, in the in the top right of your keyboard. Um, there, there are two ways you can do it. In fact, you can hit the delete key. Uh, you can also you'll see on your keyboard in the top right there's a key called backspace, and that will work just as well. Backspace will move the cursor to the right and override it. So you can either highlight the words and then hit the delete or the backspace, or you can put your cursor right here next to the F and then hit the backspace and the cursor will go one letter at a time to the left. You can hold it down and it'll move over to the left. You can delete that way as well. So there's several ways you can delete, but the easiest one once you use, once you're used to highlighting is to highlight it and hit the delete key, right? To insert, you don't have to do anything, right? Although there is actually an insert key, you don't have to use it. So if I wanted to, I wanted to put in a word uh, 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 put in a new word, all I have to do is place my cursor wherever I want that word. So let's say contains commands. And I wanted to put in the word several. Contains several commands. All I do is put my cursor next to the C, start typing S-E-V-E-R-A-L space, and it'll appear at that place. And everything else will move on to the right, including over onto the next line, if I, I, I pushed everything over. So if I literally on this one, if I typed in the word several, uh, you'll probably find that the word document at the end will, will no longer fit on this line and it will automatically overflow onto the next line. And if I'm using text justification, that line will automatically re-justify itself, which is really very, very impressive if you think about it. Um, <clears throat> next to the one, two, three, there's another button over here that says 1A, 1, 1A and I. Can you see that? Yeah. That one's a little more complicated. That's also numbering the paragraphs, but there are different ways you can number the subparagraphs. So one paragraphs one, two, three, four, easy. But what if I wanted a paragraph under paragraph two? I might want them to go 2.1, 2.2, and that's where we choose it. Do you just want they call that decibel numbering, or lawyers like to do, lawyers like to go paragraph one, one A, and then one A little, little, you know, Roman one, letter I, 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 then I, 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 and so on. They let, lawyers like to do it like that. So that allows you to do those options as well, right? Uh, so uh, if, if you wanted, let's say I create a new paragraph, but I don't, I've already got paragraphs one, two, three, and after paragraph two, I put in a new paragraph, but I don't want that to be three. I want that to be 2.1 because I'm going to have 2.1 and 2.2. Then I would use that button and choose the appropriate numbering scheme. I'm not going to bother with that right now. Um, <clears throat> uh, over here, you'll see this little button that's got like a square with dots in it, right? And that's if you wanted to... Um, uh, uh, if you if, if if you type text uh, in, in 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 columns and rows, you can put the grid around it, kind of like a like a table. So if you highlight all of this text and you use this button, it will allow you to put in either dotted lines or solid lines or whatever you want, right? And uh, the little arrow next to it is is what you actually would see. Um, uh, excuse me, it would allow you to to change what you see. So it could, a little, a little dotted line will say, I want, I want a solid line, I want a dotted line or whatever, right? The only time I ever use that is if I've typed some kind of a table, right? Where you have rows and columns and you want to put lines so that each of the words or each of the entries is in like a little box. 
Uh, that's how you would do that. Very, very simple indeed. <clears throat> and then I'll only discuss one more and then we, we can move on. Um, and that's this one over here. Can you see this one? It's got the, 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 the lines of text and it's got two arrows, one going up and one going down. What do you think that one does? This one over here. Could it um, alphabetize um, yep. the no, column no. or something? Sure. You're, 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 you're actually ahead of me there. We'll do alphabetizing in a moment. No. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> this is actually changing the spacing between the lines. So normally you've got what we call single spacing, right? The standard, the way the text is done. Like you can see the bottom of the screen, which says each tab contains several groups. That's single spacing between the two lines. If I highlighted all of that text and I press this little button here, right, with, with the arrow, it will allow me to do double spacing or one and a half spacing or triple spacing or whatever. Very seldom use that. The lawyers like it. So when lawyers type a contract, they usually do double spacing. So there's a, a quite a big gap between each line because they like to have place so they can red pencil stuff out and put in the new words and so on. Most of us never do that, but it's quite that all that it takes is that little button there, and I can make this paragraph double spaced or one and a half space or whatever I like. There are all kinds of options there, which I'm not going to bother to go into because it's not that important either. But seeing as you mentioned alphabetizing, there is a button for alphabetizing. Here it is, right? What does mm -hmm. that say? A to Z. A to Z. A to Z. Right. So if I, if I typed up my, let's say, my grocery list, and now for some reason best known to myself, I would like it in alphabetic order, just highlight the whole list, right? At, you know, bread, fruit, cheese, meat, whatever, right? And click on this, this arrow here. Now, notice that the arrow is going down, right? But you can also click on it, and it'll give you the option to go the other way, if you ever did. I can't imagine why you'd want to go from Z down to A, but you can do that too. But generally it will automatically, it will look at all of that text, those lines you've written in, and it will alphabetize them instantly. Uh, where you might use that is, let's say you've typed a name and address list. You're sending invitations to people and you like to sort that alphabetically by their last name or whatever. Uh, you can alphabetize it like that, okay? Very, so very, very powerful indeed. Very, you can see how much power there is in here and uh, it's very seldom that you need more than what's in here. But if you need more, more ways of playing with the font, there's this little arrow down here. And more ways of the paragraph, there's that little arrow down there. But, you know, that's very seldom used. So here's an example. Uh, the font, I press the down arrow, right? And a little menu will pop up. Here it is. If I click that little down arrow, uh, for, let's say for the paragraph not the font, excuse me, the paragraph, this little menu will open up and it'll allow me to do things in, in, in greater detail, right? So for example, spacing down here, you see it says spacing, which is the spacing between the line. Uh, it's set to zero, which means standard spacing. But if I, I've got two little buttons next to it, I can make it bigger or smaller. Well, I can't go smaller than zero, but I can go bigger. So if I click on that and I, uh, Again, it, it works in these strange numbers like 11. So here, if I wanted uh, one line between, one extra line between, between, say, between paragraphs, I would change this to six. Notice it's, it says zero PT. PT stands for points. And that's what this 11 thing is here. It's a, it's a printing term uh, and they measure it in points in PT. So if I change it to six, why six? I don't know, but you've got to remember that six is one line. So it'll increase it by one line. Over here is also line spacing, right? So that, that, that's the paragraph spacing. To the right of it is the line spacing. Notice it's set to single. If I press the little arrow next to it, I can go to double or triple spacing, whatever I like. Again, this is a little extra menu. How do I get rid of it? Just hit the escape key and, and it goes away, right? Can you see that? Uh, the number of times you will use this, you know, you can count on one hand because it's all here. I'll mention one more thing, and then we're going to break for the day. And this is very useful. It's slightly different in various, some versions of Word, but it's pretty much the same. So you'll see basically here at the top, it, it'll give you the name of the, of the document you're working with, right? So you can name the document. When you save it, 
when you save the document, it will create a, a document with whatever name you type and it'll put dot docx at the back. So all, all, docu all, all file names end with a period, the dot, and then three or four letters would tell the operating system what kind of file it is. And word files are automatically docx. They used to be just doc for document. And then for some reason, a number of versions ago, they added the X and I'm not sure why, but it doesn't matter because they're all compatible. Never mess with that, don't change it because otherwise, uh, don't delete the dot docx, otherwise uh, Word will no longer be able to recognize that this is a Word document. So that's what, that's how it identifies it as a Word document. And then over here, you see this uh, little light bulb and it says, tell me what you want to do. That's a very useful thing. That is like the help menu built in. You don't need a manual anymore. So if you want to know how to do something, you just point at where it says, tell me what you want to do and start typing. And you type it a question in English, right? So for example, <clears throat> I might type in there, add page numbers. See, I've written an add page. How do, I, I've forgotten how to add page numbers in. I want to number the pages. Type in add page numbers, automatically this little menu pops up. And there it is. It says add page numbers. There's an arrow to the right. And here are the various options. You can have the page numbers at the top of the page, at the bottom of the page, and so on and so forth. Okay? Or you can remove page numbers. There's an option there. I put page numbers in. I've changed my mind now. You remove the page numbers. So uh, you can either number every single page, or if you hit remove page numbers, none of the pages will be numbered. Right. So again, very powerful stuff. You don't have to, if, if, you, if you now want to get page numbers to the top of the page, you've just got to click this, this line over here where it says top of page, and it'll automatically start putting numbers at the top of the page. And if, you can also, if it's at the top of the page, it can be on the left, it can be in the middle, it can be on the right, or at a specific point. Normally, I put them in the top right or something like that, but uh, you, can, you, can, um, you can put them anywhere you like. Right? So there's an example of... Uh, typing in a question and Word will automatically answer it. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I think it's time now we can break. Uh, any questions? Now's your time to ask. Uh, I, will, I will go on, continue with this next week. Uh, if you have questions, ask them, ask them now. I had a quick question, please. Yes. I tuned in late. Thank you for having, having the class, wonderful. No um, problem. Which one, which I have 10, which one is your Microsoft Office? Sorry, say again. Which, which number is your Microsoft Office, which version? This is 2016, 2016, the latest okay, version. Right, right. Mine doesn't say, tell me what you, uh, it just has a question mark for help. Oh, oh um, uh, yeah, if you go to the question mark, one of the options will be about. If you look at okay. the question mark, about, it'll tell you what version you've got. Uh, the you. previous version before 2016 is 2013, but there's not a heck of a lot of difference between them. And like I said at the beginning of the class, uh, a new version is supposed to be coming out. Uh, can, some, can you mute your, your, everybody, can you mute, please? Somebody's, they've got noise coming from the background. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a new version coming out. Uh, the, the rumors word was going to be called Microsoft Word 2020. But I guess things got held up because of the virus. So I have a I have a 2019. Ah oh, uh, so maybe a new one did come out, uh, an, an interim yes, version. If, if but you've got the and I'm going version. to ask a, a, a question about it. Yeah, because, sure. Go ahead. Uh, when I at first when I saved a document, it has something new for me called one note or something like that. Yes. And, that, that, and that document went into OneNote. Oh, you don't want to do that. No, you don't want to do that. previous versions, it would no, only go into your document. Yeah, you don't want it to go into OneNote. OneNote so, is, OneNote is, you need to, you, 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 uh, you need to just choose the option. You just want it to go to your file. So, right, but can I make, but, can I make documents my a default? Yes, yes, yes. I, how would I do that? Um, uh, I'm not sure because that is a new feature in 2019. Oh, okay. But when yeah, you save, had... when you save, the option will always be there of where it is to save to. 
right? Mm -hmm. So you may have, you may have then just clicked immediately and it, for some reason put it into OneNote. It shouldn't do that. Well, the, the, well that's what it does. Yeah, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't do that, right? It shouldn't do that. that, that that's a bit silly because OneNote's very useful. It's like a note system and it's useful for transferring information to other people and so on. But mostly you just want to store it in my documents, right? In my doc but it didn't give me that option. And I didn't know it had done that until I was looking for it and couldn't uh, find it. And I'd, then I'd, I'd need to, you know what? Had I need to, I'd, I'd need to see that. I, I, I'll, oh. I'll look it up and I'll, remind me next time I look it up and I'll answer that question for you. Okay. But usually there is an option. I think you probably just clicked automatically and missed the option, but it always got the option to put it anywhere on the disk. Doesn't even have to be in my documents. That would be the logical place, but you can put it anywhere you like. So all you need is the option that says, you know, I want it to go onto my disk, right? Or alternatively, you might want to store it in the cloud. So you can also store it in Microsoft Cloud. <clears throat> I don't questions? know. I don't know what happened. I just know that it's probably it's a simple. No <laughs> it's, it's probably a simple thing that when you save it again, look at the options that it's given you. Uh, it, okay. it should always give you the options and not just not decide where to put it itself. Uh, the only uh, um, the only difference to that is if you use the free version that I mentioned to you, the one that's through the browser, right? Um, that automatically saves not onto your drive, but into the cloud, into Microsoft's cloud. Uh, we, we, and, the good, and, the, and the good thing about that is, is now you can access that document from anywhere, from any computer. So if you go somewhere else and you don't have your computer with you, you can use any other computer, go to the cloud and your document will be there because it's stored on one of Microsoft's computers which you can always get to whether you're on your computer or your, or your iPad I, or my computer or whatever. I think this, this thing was designed so people could work on the project, you know, at various yes, people. Yes, yes. But, but this is my own and I don't plan. No, exactly. That's what I said. It's for, for transferring documents, particularly if you're working in a team. But there's always the option to save it on your hard drive, personally. So you must have just missed that. And I'll look it up and I'll let you know next time. Okay. Jeff, Any other questions? Jeff, not a question, but this is Maxine. I just wanted to connect with you. Sure. And let you know that uh, your uh, class is.